Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I'm Paul TX141 Walsh, welcome you to an all new Ace in the Day gameplay for the arcade mode of War Thunder. In today's episode we shall be reviewing, by popular demand, the Ki-109, a Japanese interceptor stroke heavy fighter coming at a tier 3 and a battery rating of 4.7. For the purposes of today's historical overview, I'll be covering the Ki-109 from its inception through to its combat service. With that, let's begin. With the rising threat of the American B-29 Superfortress High Altitude Bomber conducting operations over the Japanese mainland, the Imperial Japanese Army Air Force, the IJAAF, had an ongoing requirement for a dedicated bomber hunter. A review of the Air Force's existing inventory led to the Mitsubishi Ki-67 Hiryu twin-engine medium bomber being selected as the aircraft on which to base this bomber hunter. The reason for this was that the Ki-67's overall performance, in terms of top speed, climb rate and manoeuvrability, was perceived to far surpass that of any contemporary Allied bomber in late 1943, examples including the B-25 Mitchell, making it an ideal aircraft to convert into the bomber hunter role. As a result, Mitsubishi proposed their first design under the designation of Ki-109 in November 1943. This involved two aircraft which formed a hunter-killer team. The hunter was designated as Ki-109B. It was equipped with a radar reflector and a nose-mounted 40cm searchlight to detect and track the enemy aircraft. The killer, meanwhile, designated Ki 109A, was equipped with two obliquely mounted 37mm Ho 203 cannon to bring down the aircraft detected by the hunter. These aircraft would be purely for night operations, however, it was soon realised that this hunter killer approach would be overly complicated and it was scrapped. Instead, a second design was proposed by the start of 1944 to convert the Ki 67 into a daytime heavy fighter by removing the Ki 67's bomb ordnance and mounting a 75mm Type 88 cannon in the nose. This second design was approved for prototyping as the 20th of February 1944, and it was soon found with the first prototype in August of 1944 that the 75mm compromised the plane's top speed and manoeuvrability to an extent. To resolve this, as the third aircraft produced, the original dorsal turret and lateral defensive machine gun positions of the Ki-67 would be removed, meaning the plane would only be defended by a single 12.7mm Ho-103 machine gun as mounted in the tail. This change was deemed as acceptable as it was assumed that the B-29s would operate without fighter cover. By the autumn of said year, the Ki-109 entered production as the Ki-109 Army Heavy Fighter Interceptor, with a total of 24 aircraft produced, including the two initial prototypes. Externally, the Ki-109 looked very similar to the Ki-67. In terms of power plant, the Ki-109 was powered by a pair of Mitsubishi Ha-104 1900 horsepower radial engines. Entering service in 1945 with the 107th Heavy Fighter Regiment, the Ki-109 proved to be a failure as it lacked the overall speed and rate of climb to successfully intercept the B-29 formations. Despite multiple attempts, the Ki-109 was to never make contact with a single B-29 formation whilst in service. Moreover, when the American bombers switched to low-level nighttime raids, this made the Ki-109 redundant as it lacked radar, leading to it being retired from service as of the 30th of July 1945. And so, with our historical overview concluded, Let's just take a look at how the Ki-109 hands in the skies of War Thunder Arcade. Today's gameplay is brought to you from the frontline map Caucasus. For this we'll be using the following setup. Ground target belts for our 75mm cannon. The reason being in my experience the ground target belt is the most ideal for dealing with enemy aircraft. With its sole constituent shell being the high explosive fragmentation incendiary tracer. As for our defensive machine gun, we've taken the universal belts as these are the most powerful in my experience and we'll come onto the role of the defensive machine gun later on in this review. Our gun convergence is set to 500m, noting it does not affect our 75mm cannon as it's mounted down the centre line in the nose. And as for our fuel load, we're taking the standard 30 minute fuel load to ensure we can make it to the end of the game, unscaled on fuel capacity. We begin our analysis as always by talking about the Ki 109's climb rate, and what's interesting about this plane is that it's a hidden strength. Now from the outset you may be thinking to yourself, well this plane gets a fighter spawn, not a dedicated attacker spawn, so surely this plane is going to be at a disadvantage in the race for altitude. In the short term, I definitely agree with you. Planes such as the F8F-1 Bearcat and the Ki-84 Co are all going to outclimb this plane rather rapidly. But you have a highly sustainable climb rate for the long term, meaning that you can creep from a starting altitude of 2,500 meters all the way up to 4,500 meters altitude or even above 5,000 meters altitude in a single climb as balanced over more emergency power cycles as what you're seeing here. And in turn this enables you to surprise a lot of opposition in the fact that you're going to be one of the first planes to just gradually push beyond 5,000 meters altitude. Not able to outrun the likes of the Messerschmitt 192s, but able to put yourself in a position whereby you actually start to become a threat that the enemy team needs to deal with. 
And here what you're seeing in this frontline game is the vast majority of the enemy team have decided to stay low, defending their own ground units, attacking our ground units and attacking our aircraft trying to eliminate their own ground units. And in return there's only one enemy fighter that's actually gone for altitude and it's going to be a P-51 cannon armed Mustang who's coming up out of the clouds right now on our left hand side. And we're in a prime position here because what's nice about this plane is it does not take a lot of effort to recover this plane from a climb or rebuild its energy when coming out of a climb. The P-51 meanwhile has sacrificed all their energy, gone into a store as they've tried to go into a very late head-to-head -head with us, they haven't had the energy to do so and we've been able to intercept them and get them out of the way. Now we'll come on to the concepts of energy recovery and energy retention a little bit later, but the important thing about eliminating that P-51 is this emphasises the historical role of this plane and how it's translated into War Thunder Arcade. This plane was built with the intention of operating in a situation whereby there was no fight to cover for the enemy bombers, and you need that as much as possible to go after the enemy bombers, because you can bring down enemy fighters and you will see that a number of times in this game. But ideally, your role is bring down the bombers, you're the first and foremost to do it because you have the armament and the pace to do so. Now of course there are going to be a lot of aircraft with 20mm cannon, such as the Messerschmitt 199G2, the Focke 190A4, etc. that can bring down bombers just as rapidly. But the idea is whereas they go and distract the enemy fighters, you're the one who can creep after the enemy bombers at a decent pace and bring them down. And then going after this Halifax Mark III, you'll see that we only need one shot, and we don't need to get ludicrously close because we have a muzzle velocity of 830 meters per second on our high explosive shells. Albeit the offset to this is the fact that you have a poor fire rate on this gun, only being able to fire one round every two and a half seconds approximately. So in turn you need to make sure every shell counts. And that's because if you're wondering why the poor fire rate exists, this cannon was manually loaded. It's an anti-aircraft gun that's been adapted into the aircraft. And as we dive down this Halifax Mark III, the second one that we're facing, we're going to emphasise this point by missing our initial shot. Now we can attribute this to a number of factors, one of them being poor aim, the other being the poor high speed handling of this aircraft. But know what I've done here to give myself ample opportunity to get rid of this bomber. I've made sure it's not going to have any cover as it tries to take evasive manoeuvres and I begin my follow up pursuit. And on my third shot, I score the hit that eliminates the bomber out of the game. And in return, looking towards the enemy spawn, we can see that a P-51 Mustang is now charging over, but it's over three kilometers away, it's not going to catch us. And this is the point where we start to talk about energy retention and energy recovery. In the format of energy retention, this plane is quite decent. In the vertical, we'll actually find that over a boom and zoom distance of 1,250 meters on engine power alone, this plane will start off its dive and return to its starting point with the same altitude and the same kinetic energy or speed. If you add in more emergency power, you can kick this threshold up to 1,750 meters with a returning climb angle of 30 degrees. This means that you can conduct boom and zoom operations, and when chasing down any bombers that have decided to dive away from you, you should not see this as too much of a risk, as long as you're not diving across the enemy spawn at close range, I from say three kilometers away. In the horizontal, the horizontal energy retention of this plane is extremely strong for dedicated turns. Outside this, if your opponent starts to throw in things such as a climbing spiral, or alternatively starts throwing in dedicated loops, that's where the difficulty is going to come in. Because the loop circle of this plane is going to bleed a lot of energy, we'll come to that as part of the control surface review, but in general this plane is not going to do well in a turn fight that very quickly starts to mix things up. But in just standard turns, you'll be absolutely fine. And as for straight line energy retention, for the plane's relative size, this plane is able to start holding its speed when coming out of a high speed dive at 530 km an hour, which can actually make it quite awkward for a good number of heavy fighters that try to chase it down, on top of that for bombers that are trying to dive away from this aircraft and then level out to hit their targets. This plane is going to be biting on their heels. And even some fighters are going to take an excruciating period of time to catch up to you. The likes of the Yak-9s, not the Yak-9U, but the Yak-9K and the Yak-9T come to mind, and along with that the Japanese fighters such as the Zeros. Now in continuing with the theme of diving, this plane builds up its speed rather rapidly in a dive, getting up to 800 km an hour and average rate comparable with the Yak-19 and Yak-9K. On top of this one must consider that your acceleration only starts to drop off at 800 km an hour and this is not a handicap because most bombers will struggle to get beyond 900 km an hour like yourself while your maximum dive speed being 873 km an hour. So this puts you in a prime position to chase after those bombers who want to take evasive manoeuvres by simply pointing their nose towards the deck. In straight line regards, in terms of straight line acceleration, you have an average acceleration from 130 km an hour to 400 km an hour comparable to the Japanese Zeros, like the A6M3 and the A6M5 at your battle rating. With more emergency power, you can kick this threshold up to 450 km an hour and your acceleration begins to gradually drop off. This means that you can build up your speed rapidly, and as highlighted earlier when coming out of a climb, you're never going to feel as though you're in a difficult position to regain the energy you've lost. 
and this even translates into the concept of stalling. While the plane's low stall speed of 130 km an hour, and its stall recovery does require you to get the plane back up to 260 km an hour. But in the process, this plane is very nice in a stall, and its nose will just gradually drop down, and the plane will quickly build up its speed to 260 km an hour as part of the drop down process, and in return you only lose up to a maximum of 250 meters altitude if you keep the plane pointing in a single direction and do not try to angle it on its ailerons as part of the stall recovery. Doing so by angling on the ailerons, then you're going to have the risk of kicking this plane into a flat spin, or alternatively just compromising your position as you hang limp in the sky. So playing smart and playing sensible with the control surfaces of the plane will allow you to get the most out of it. Try not to do anything too tricky here. And that's where this translates into the concept of high speed diving after opponents in terms of controllability. If we talk about the control surfaces in their ideal speed range of 350 to 500 km an hour, what you'll find is that this plane handles rather nicely. And even if you go down to lower speeds, i.e. 275 km an hour being your bottom threshold, this plane will still retain its controllability to a high extent. Albeit what you'll find is, once you go below 350 km an hour, the elevator of this plane starts to require a little bit more effort to get it to work, and the plane starts to head towards the regions feeling slight stall effects. And this can make things a little bit difficult, particularly when you've got an enemy fighter right on your six, and you're having to take some evasive maneuvers to try and keep that fighter at bay. And again we can see off to our right side a P-51 Mustang making their way over to us, we're calling the energy situation out appropriately, going into a quick climb here, and we can see that the P-51, if they decide to come up towards us, is not going to have the energy in their climb in order to be able to bring us down before we're able to hammerhead over the top and dispatch them via a drop, much like earlier. And this is where we come on to those individual control surfaces. In terms of your roll rate or your ailerons, you'll find that your roll rate is the slightest and weakest aspect of this aircraft, as we take some grazing fire to our rudder from the P-51. But we called the energy situation right, and we come down much like earlier on. Goodbye. The roll rate of this plane is very slow. It's the weakest, as just iterated, and what that effectively means is, as we run away from the Spitfire Mark 1 here, using our durability to our advantage, and also our dive speed, as we mentioned earlier, is that you're not going to have an easy time of trying to change up directionality on the fly, and this only gets worse in a high-speed dive. Going from 550 to 700 km now, you'll find that you lose 75% of your already terrible roll rate, making this plane extremely difficult to roll when trying to follow an opponent in a high-speed dive, meaning that you need to take your foes by surprise, make sure they cannot change up their directionality. And the only planes you can really track in such a high-speed dive if they're trying to be evasive is an enemy bomber that also has the issue of locking up its ailerons. As for your rudder, this is your strongest control surface, where the initial response in particular enables you to conduct very strong hammerhead manoeuvres and also downward turns in this plane. If you're in a level flying position, roll it 90 degrees and then pull up on the elevator, add in the rudder and this plane comes around at an exceptional rate, meaning that you can actually start to turn fight with the likes of P-38J-15 Lightnings because you have a turn circle that's actually tighter than them in this configuration. Heavy fighters such as the Messerschmitt 110s however will outturn you and it's the same with the bow fighters so you have to balance out your turn fighting capabilities. And a standard single engine fighter, all of them are going to be outturning you in the long haul. So I would avoid turning fighting with them wherever possible. When you go into a high speed dive there is no lock up on the rudder alone. However what one has to consider is there is a lock up applied to the rudder at the 550 to 700 km an hour point if you try to combine the rudder with the ailerons. And this means that you do not want to combine the two and it makes it very difficult for you to achieve pinpoint aim in a dive when you're starting to roll the plane to follow a target and then you bring your rudder in to try and hit the target because the rudder is also prone to being hit by this 75% lock up threshold. And you'll note wherever possible in a dive we've been only trying to use a single control surface to make a manoeuvre adjustment. We've not been trying to bring in all the control surfaces as you would in a dedicated boom and zoom aircraft such as the P-51 D-30 Mustang. Now as for our elevator, this is also rather strong. In that whilst you have a wide looping circle as would be inherent in an aircraft of this type, your elevator responds very well to input and allows you to conduct turns at a decent rate. And in a high speed dive what you'll find is the responsiveness of the elevator beyond 500 km now only improves considerably, giving you the ability to loop both in the positive and negative G aspects at a rather nice rate. And I would recommend if you've got an enemy Thunderbolt in your 6, by a P-47N15, that every so often you do decide to toss in a negative G loop as it's going to throw a lot of foes by surprise, especially seeing as their negative G aspect in their elevator is going to be weaker compared to yours. Albeit keep in mind they may just simply roll the aircraft 180 degrees and then just pull up on the stick a positive G loop once again to follow you, if they come in at a longer distance and see what's coming. And this does give you some capability to take evasive action on a high speed dive, albeit it's going to be based primarily around the elevator. And this also means that you're able to track the large aircraft, either bombers that you chase in the dive, but nothing really much else. 
every other target you're going for in a dive you want to catch by surprise or see that it's distracted by one of your allies whether it be a bomber they're chasing after or one of your friendly fighters who just needs a help in hand. Now outside of control surfaces, high speed diving etc, what else is there to note? Well this plane is interesting in terms of its high altitude performance or its overall ideal altitude range. The performance of this plane is consistent all the way from the ground level all the way up to 6,500 meters altitude. At which point what you'll find is the acceleration on the engines or the overall engine output starts to drop off gradually. Now this is important in the fact that it's not a massive decline, it's only when you hit 7,500 meters altitude that you'll start to see this. And you can be one of those dedicated aircraft that when the enemy team's been able to get a B-17 over your base in a ground strike game all the way up to say 7,000 or 8,000 meters altitude, you can be the one to successfully chase down the bomber. Because what you can do is combine this aspect with the long range of your gun which extends all the way up to approximately two and a half kilometers in order to bring down the bomber when outside of the range of its defensive machine guns. And I have picked up a couple of long distance snipes in this aircraft, you're not going to see any in this gameplay, but take my word for it, you can be a real problem for enemy bombers who are not going to see those 75mm shells coming, despite the tracer being visible from a long way off. And here we're missing our targets, in terms of missing our shots on the key 49 Mark 1, but we're getting ample time to engage them, bringing in the concept from earlier against the second Halifax, and make sure we've got ample time and for us here, the Key 49 is trying to turn fight with us and use their turrets to bring us down. As for your control surfaces, what you'll find is at 7,000 meters altitude, you start to lose a degree of your elevator's responsiveness, and this is your maximum threshold for high altitude combat on the controls. But in terms of the ideal altitude range itself, I'd recommend anywhere between 3,000 and 6,000 meters altitude, keeping in mind your primary role, first and foremost, is bring down the enemy bombers up on high. And your second role is to frustrate the enemy fighters who try to climb after you, based on the fact that they were not there in the first instance to intercept you, such as that Yak-7 there, as we pick up our sixth and final kill of this gameplay. If the enemy fighters are all up and high, you are going to have to try and play defensively, and you may be forced to stay at extremely low altitude for the vast majority of the game, and simply act as a goalkeeper, staying low, waiting for the bombers to come charging in, or ground attack aircraft to come charging in towards your ground units, and bringing them down as a last resort. And it can be a frustrating experience in that regard, when the entirety of the enemy team is dedicated to high altitude combat and your teammates seem to just stay low. But it's one of those things you're going to have to deal with, as this aircraft is made for a very specific purpose, and as soon as you take it outside that purpose, despite the fact we're pushing it to some extent here, it really does start to struggle, as one would perhaps expect with the Key 109. Now a couple of other things we have not covered, durability. You'll note that I've taken considerable damage from a number of machine gun calibre weapons, and also on top of that perhaps even some cannon fire, depending on whether the second Mustang was armed with 20mm cannon, I cannot recall exactly. This plane is rather durable across its airframe, but only the airframe I should point out. The cockpit is exposed and you will find that both the pilot and the co-pilot can be very easily injured in this aircraft, even when you have a maximum crew skill build. Therefore I would avoid going head to head with too many targets. You can against bombers to a degree, but do keep in mind this approach will eventually see your crew start to get wounded. The engines can take considerable damage before they start to lose performance. It's only when they go red on the damage indicator in the bottom left hand corner of your screen that they'll actually see an impact to their performance. The orange state on my right hand engine now, we're not seeing any performance drop off. The only downside unfortunately with this plane's durability on the whole is that the control surfaces are susceptible to taking damage. Particularly the rudder, it's going to be the easiest one to cut off of this aircraft and you'll find that once the rudder completely goes, you'll be forced to bow out of this plane. There is no alternative, if the rudder comes cleanly off the aircraft, the game will force you to J out effectively. As for flammability concerns, this plane does catch fire quite often. Based on 12.7mm Browning machine gun rounds coming in, the incendiary type, and you'll find that they'll strike the fuel tanks based in the wing and this plane will start to burn. But these fuel tanks are self-sealing and do have a chance to see the fire go out and the plane continue on its merry way, so do not write off the aircraft as soon as it catches fire. I've had a number of aircraft, or instances of the Key 109 I should say, where I've been able to recover it from a fire and actually bring it home to land. Now the last aspect I want to point out is the time wasting potential of this aircraft. You'll see it in the case of this A6M3 here who's going to chase us for the rest of this game, almost 10 minutes of the game remaining. Now I'm not going to show you the entire clip because that would be a time waster, but my point is that this plane, because it maintains such strong performance up high, particularly an A6M3 which lacks the overall top speed in the first instance, it will eventually catch us but it takes a long time to do so. It means that you can actually waste the time of a lot of players who would just try to chase after you because they'll see you as quite an easy kill. Now this does conversely bring us onto the concept of the defensive machine gun, why do I not try to use that to bring down the zero? 
Well the problem is with this defensive machine gun, by the time you get it into a position where it can do considerable damage, it's extremely likely at your batter rating, while if your foe's been typically armed with multiple 20mm cannon, or a large array of high caliber machine guns, you'll already be dead, or at least the gunner will be knocked down, as the gunner is quite exposed in the rear of the aircraft. I would not rely on your machine gun, as even a means of giving you a warning. If the machine gun starts to open fire, it's typically the fact that you've left it too late to spot the aggressor. You need to always be looking around your aircraft to see what's coming in. If you can detect a fire at a distance of 1.75 kilometers and then start to take evasive action, you'll typically be safe in this aircraft unless they're absolutely adamant on pursuing you. But if you wait until the machine gun gives you the alert, by that time, by the time you take the evasive maneuvers, even if you're in a high speed situation, your foe locks up all their control surfaces, they'll typically be able to follow you enough to be able to cause you considerable damage. And again, it's strengthened earlier by the fact that if you start to lose your control surfaces, which have a high chance of doing so, this plane becomes even more awkward to fly and gives you a high chance of crashing into a landmass, particularly if you start to see the ailerons go completely on one side of the aircraft, and it just makes things very difficult. So alertness is going to be key to your survival, not the reliance on that defensive machine gun. It can do some damage, it can pick up the occasional assist, but I must stress, in all the games I've played in this aircraft, in excess of 50, I've yet to pick up a kill with a defensive machine gun, and I think I've only picked up approximately 5 assists in all my flyouts. All my kills have been picked up through using the main gun, and just simply keeping my eyes out for what's incoming. Now that's not to say, I like this A6M3, there will be players who just simply hunt you down for the entirety of the game, and it is something you just have to get used to. But, in wasting their time, you can enable your teammates to bring down the ground targets on the enemy team, and that enables your team to win the game. Or at least it's one or two enemy aircraft that are taking themselves out of the match to chase down an aircraft that enjoys flying higher. Now if this was a Messerschmitt 109, they would be catching a lot faster, but the same principle applies. In the case of the Zero, we're wasting 10 minutes of their time. In the case of the Messerschmitt, we may waste 2 to 3 minutes of their time. And that time can count towards your team's chances of victory. But now we're going to skip on to the end of the gameplay just to show how long they were pursuing us to emphasise this point, and then we'll be switching over to the post-game stats. With our 6 kills we're able to pick up 26,000 silver lions and 2,986 research points. To defeat the Key 109 in a given matchup, I can recommend one or two approaches. The first applies to the vast majority of cases, whether you're flying a heavy fighter such as the Messerschmitt 110, the bow fighter, the Mosquito, or the Keener 108, or alternatively, any of the single engine, fighter, and interceptor aircraft that this plane can face at its battle rating, and that is to force this aircraft into a turn fight, making sure not to keep the turn fight constricted to just standard turns, as that's where the horizontal energy retention of this plane will outweigh its rather poor turn circle by comparison to an extent. Instead, what you want to do is mix up the maneuvers, forcing the plane into a set of scissors that is really going to play against this plane's rather poor roll rate, and in return give you the advantage and enable you to come around on its six and start cutting into it. The only thing you'll need to be wary of at this point is the defensive machine gun, which can be quickly eliminated, or you may even find you're able to cause the Key 109 to hit their stall speed of 130 km an hour, and they'll just hang there in front of you, not able to bring that defensive machine gun to bear, and you can cut them apart. Option number two is for the limited cases where you're flying a bomber, for example, such as the B-25 Mitchell, which has nose-mounted armament that is controlled by the pilot, but not by an operating gunner. The idea here being that these planes are not as manoeuvrable and are going to rely on their firepower to bring you down, and on top of that the altitude asset they have to sit above you in the first instance. And this also applies to heavy fighters such as the P-38J-15 Lightning. You want to be above the Key 109 and you want to attack it hard via boom and zoom strikes, being wary of the fact it's coming up towards you and may have its 75mm cannon pointed towards your fuselage, but because you have that energy advantage you can stay above the incoming fire and swoop down on the target and eventually dispatch them, or at least force them to go to lower altitude and stay in that goalkeeper role as mentioned earlier. But by avoiding such circumstances today in our own Key 109, hopefully we demonstrate that this heavy fighter interceptor aircraft does hold its own at its battle rating. There are by far a number of aircraft which can achieve the same role and do a lot more within the fighter and interceptor category. The Messerschmitt 109s available, for example, are going to be planes that can do exactly what this plane does, but even better in terms of the amount of armament that's available and then go on to be that dedicated fighter. But this plane should not be overwritten in terms of its ability to defeat the enemy's bomber strategy. If you find a large number of enemy bombers flying up on high and no one on your team is willing to commit to taking them out, you can be the one to do so. And every so often, you can have some fun in forcing enemy fighters to stall out in your wake, and you hammer head over the top and eliminate them out of the game. 
But keep in mind at the end of the day, this plan was designed for a singular role. And if you apply it to that singular role, you're going to have success, but anything outside of that role, and you're really pushing the boundaries. But then again, seeing as there's very few of these planes currently flying in the skies of War Thunder Arcade at the moment, it may just be that's all that's needed, and you can start to take your opponents with the element of surprise. And so I've been TX141, and if you have enjoyed this video, why not leave a like, comment or subscribe for future War Thunder videos on my channel. But until next time, as always, ladies and gentlemen, take care, and good luck in the skies.